This is Elsick Hall. Until it was demolished in 1978, it used to stand in Elsick Park on the site where the swimming pool is today. In 1839, the hall's new owner, Richard Granger, announced that Elsick Hall will one day be the centre of Newcastle. Elsick was at this time mainly an agricultural area, so this was a big claim. Who was Richard Granger? Granger was born in 1797 in Highfriars Lane in the centre of Newcastle. His father was a quayside porter. When Richard was only 13, his father died. His mother supported the family, working at various jobs, including washing and glove making. After leaving school at age 14, Richard was apprenticed to a local carpenter and afterwards set up his own building firm with his brother George, who was a bricklayer. Sadly, George died soon after this and Richard continued to run the business on his own. His earliest major contract was to build a row of houses in Newcastle, three of which still stand today in Highham Place behind the Laying Art Gallery. Richard's business ambitions received a big boost with his marriage to Rachel Arundel, daughter of a wealthy leather merchant. She brought with her a dowry of £5,000, which gave him the capital to invest in his first big venture as a property developer. In less than seven years, Granger, together with his colleagues John Dobson, the architect, and John Clayton, the town clerk of Newcastle, transformed the old medieval town centre of Newcastle. Some of the most important streets and buildings in the town today were built by Granger. Granger Street, Grey Street, the Theatre Royal, the Granger Market, as well as others such as the Royal Arcade, which disappeared in the next great redevelopment of the 1960s. Granger was celebrated for his achievements and raised the reputation of the town. One visitor remarked, you walk into what has long been termed the coal hole of the north and find yourself in a city of palaces, a fairyland of newness, brightness and modern elegance. But Granger had even greater ambitions. He next turned his attention to the area west of the town centre, which had only recently been incorporated into Newcastle. In 1839, he bought the 800-acre Elsick Estate, including the fine mansion of Elsick Hall, set in its own landscaped grounds. This became home to the Granger family, Richard, Rachel and their 11 children. Granger was not just looking for a grand home. Moving to the Hall placed him at the heart of his planned new development for Elsick. His plan was for a comprehensive development of this largely green field area to create what was almost a new town on the edge of Newcastle. But only three years later, Granger got into serious financial difficulties and was forced to abandon his grand plans. However, the scale of his ambition remains impressive. There would be thousands of new homes. As its industrial and commercial role expanded, Newcastle was desperately short of housing for its rapidly growing population. By the time Granger got into difficulties, only a few houses had actually been built including this terrace on Westgate Road, which still stands today. The plans included new industrial development along the banks of the Tyne. Granger planned to enclose sections of the riverfront and build new quays. At this time, most of this land was undeveloped, with a scattering of small factories, fisheries, coal mining shafts and coal staiths from which the coal was exported downriver from local pits, but there were already signs that new industries would soon be springing up in response to the opportunities presented by the Industrial Revolution. William Armstrong had recently commissioned a detailed survey of this riverside land with a view to setting up the engineering factory that would within a few decades become Newcastle's biggest employer. Granger also realised that his new town would need good communications. At this time, there was no central station in Newcastle, although several railway lines coming near to the town were being built independently of each other. Granger proposed to bring all of these railway lines into a new central terminus and goods depot to be built in Elsick. This would be connected by branch lines to the waterfront 
and also to new roads. Granger thought that his new town would need a church to serve its new residents. He asked his colleague, the architect John Dobson, to design one for him. This was to be a grand building holding over a thousand worshippers. The church was never built, but the plans survive. Granger also proposed to build a new workhouse on his Elsig land, but the Newcastle Board of Guardians, who were in charge of administering the poor law locally, decided to site this further north. The workhouse later became part of the General Hospital on Westgate Road and is one of the few older buildings remaining on that site. Perhaps the biggest disappointment for us today is that the zoological and botanical gardens planned for Elsick were never built. The plans reached quite an advanced stage, including arrangements to receive the first animals and birds. Unfortunately, this was another casualty of the collapse of Granger's scheme. What went wrong? Granger had borrowed a considerable amount of money to fund the purchase of the Elsig land and needed quick results to pay off not only these debts, but also those he had incurred from his town centre developments. His financial situation grew increasingly precarious and he narrowly avoided bankruptcy and jail. The family was forced to sell Elsick Hall and most of the land and move into a more modest home in Clayton Street West in Newcastle. Granger's grand plan for Elsick was never implemented, but he was proved correct about its developmental potential. Over the next 60 years, Elsick was to become one of the foremost industrial areas of the world and its population soared from 3,500 to almost 60,000. Richard Granger returned to the West End after his death in 1861. He is buried in St James's graveyard in Benwell together with his wife Rachel and four of his children.